Thank you very much, Victor, for your kind words. Thank you all for coming out. I'm honored that you're here. And uh, what I'd like to do is tell you some stories about fossils. So that's what I love to do. I love when fossils tell an extra story. So that's what we'll get into. Um, but just before we do that, I want to show you this lovely illustration that was done by one of our resident artists, Shu Shoemaker. And you're probably wondering why I have this beautiful illustration of a dragon. Look at its tongue. Look at the tip of the tongue. Apparently, during the uh, Middle Ages, it was thought that shark teeth weren't shark teeth. They didn't make the connection. A lot of people didn't know. They thought they were the tip of a dragon's tongue. And so I asked Chu to do this illustration showing a megalodon tooth at the very end of the dragon tongue. So I just wanted to share that with you. And also, before we get into the stories about what uh, some bones that we found along Calvert Cliffs and elsewhere can tell us about interactions between megalodon and their prey, I thought that I would um, do an opening act uh, and show you some of the teeth that were actually modified by Amerindians, by uh, Native American Indians. So we sometimes think that we're the first people who have an interest in, in fossils and paleontology. Uh, it's now known that um, shark teeth have been used for thousands of years as tools for uh, hunting, for personal adornment. And so I'm going to show you um, some of those uh, shark teeth that we found locally and elsewhere. So why do we have so many shark teeth here? Just very briefly, during the Miocene, on average, global temperatures were warmer than they are today. There was no ice at the North Pole, less ice at the South Pole. So if you melt those polar ice caps, you raise the level of the water in the ocean. It floods the Atlantic coastal plain. And the rivers that were flowing uh, into the, this um, inland extension uh, of the Atlantic Ocean were carrying sediments with them. And the animals that were living in that ocean were dying and settling to the bottom of the ocean, and those sediments were covering them. And so now those sediments are exposed along Calvert Cliffs. And because of tectonic forces, those cliffs have been raised somewhat. And as the waves erode those cliffs, the uh, fossils come out. So uh, all the red dots here, mostly on the eastern shore, are locations where fossil uh, shark teeth have been found in archaeological context. So they've been found at actual archaeological sites with other implements that were made by uh, American Indians. And doubtless, there are more sites than what I've shown you there. So this is a, a typical site. You can see the oyster shells from the oyster midden. And at this particular site, uh, four Hastalis, Carcardon Hastalis, so this is the ancestor of the living great white shark. A, t um, a shark were found, four, four of its teeth were found here, and you can see them right here. And each one of these teeth was notched. So this was a little cache of teeth that somebody had, and they were using them as projectile points, as spears or arrowheads. And you'll notice one of the characteristics of these kinds of teeth is that at the base of the cutting edge of the tooth, it's often notched so that the tooth can be lashed with sinew onto a stick so that it can be used and held onto to be used as a tool. So this is a rather lovely megalodon tooth, and you'll notice the red arrows are pointing here at the base of the cutting edge where the tooth was notched. And uh, it was used so extensively that uh, the cutting edge was worn away. So they were using it as a cutting tool or a scraping tool. What's fascinating about fossil shark teeth that occur along the Atlantic coastal plain is that they've been found as far west as Ohio in places where fossil shark teeth just don't exist otherwise. So the um, Indians were collecting these teeth, they were trading them, they were moving them around, and they were being used as, as tools here in Ohio. And these are burial mounds where the teeth have been found. So here are some of the artifacts that have been recovered from those burial mounds. And you can see that uh, there's a Hastalis tooth here, and uh, I'm not sure what this tooth is. I'm sure somebody here <laughs> knows what that is. But uh, it's another fossil shark tooth that was collected along the Atlantic coastal plain. Here are some more examples of some megalodon teeth and another very large Hastalis tooth. So here we have some of the diversity uh, in which uh, the, the teeth were being modified for various uh, purposes. So look through your collection, if you have a large collection of shark teeth, and you might find some like this, where the, the root was uh, notched, uh, was broken off, or it was notched. Notched is the most common. And even shark teeth have been found that were drilled. And I'm not sure why they were drilled, 
Um, I won't get into that now, but uh, they may have been used just for personal adornment. Here's a, a stylus tooth, a snaggle tooth, I'm sorry, um, a snaggle tooth, a shark tooth that was modified. I'm not sure what kind of shark tooth this is. Uh, it's a really worn one, uh, but it appears to have also been modified. Here's some megalodon teeth that were all found in the same riverbed, and you can see that they were all tooled with the uh, base of the, of the root of the tooth being broken away. Here's a very strange one, and I'm sorry, I don't know where this tooth was originally found. It is not local. I believe it's from Georgia or the Carolinas. And you'll notice how the, the cutting edge of the tooth was notched. And again, I don't know why this was done or what purpose it served. And finally, just some more examples of megalodon teeth that have been notched, that have been found locally. So megalodon, apex predator. I think we all know that. Um, what I've noticed on the internet at looking at uh, illustrations of megalodon over the years is that they continue to get larger and larger and larger. And of course, in 2013, there was the mockumentary that was made by Discovery Channel purporting that uh, megalodon was still alive. And of course, there have been movies made about megalodon. I haven't seen this particular movie, but I love this advertisement for the movie. Uh, it's a megalodon versus this giant octopus. So notice this very interesting ornamentation on the back of the octopus. Does anyone recognize what that is? Sorry? Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a ceratopsian skull. So the artist who drafted this illustration took the front half end of a, a horned dinosaur like Chasmosaurus, a relative of Triceratops, and uh, just slapped it on the back of the giant octopus. Vertebrates rule. And of course, I saw Meg a couple of years ago. So I love the movie. I found myself laughing during parts of the movie that I don't think were intended to be funny. But it was a great romp, so it was, it was uh, good. So, in 2017, I have had the pleasure of working with a French film company on a documentary about Megalodon, and they commissioned some high-end uh, art and uh, uh, CG graphics, some animations, and this was their restoration of Megalodon. Basically, it's, um, it's a great white shark that's just continued to grow, okay, from a 20-foot long individual to one that's over uh, 60 feet long. The reality is that we don't really know what megalodon looked like because all we have are the teeth and uh, some associated vertebrae. But this is a relatively conservative restoration of what megalodon probably looked like. Because um, the great white shark and megalodon are both lambdaform sharks, they conform to a certain body form, which is what we see here. Uh, in 2017, along with that same, uh, during that, the, the filming of that same um, documentary on Megalodon, I had the chance to travel to the Atacama Desert in Peru, the driest place on Earth where there's just like no vegetation whatsoever, whatsoever when you get out into the desert. And in a small village adjacent to the desert, to Okukaji, there was this lovely restoration of the head of Megalodon. And I would love to have something like that here at this museum. So we know megalodon existed in the fossil record from about 20 million years ago, 22, 20 million years ago, to about three and a half million years ago. So that's a pretty good run for uh, an apex predator. Now if you step back and look more broadly at the family to which megalodon belonged, the Othodontidae, most of uh, the stories about the evolutionary history of that family begin about 60 million years ago. But I'm not gonna get into that because Victor's gonna take care of that during his talk, the next talk on November Fourth. So let's look at some examples of a predation of megalodon and their, and their uh, prey. So we know that megalodon was interacting with marine mammals locally because from time to time we find fossilized bones like this partial lower jaw of a baleen whale, a Miocene baleen whale, and here's the illustration. So during the Miocene, 
Whales on average were smaller than they are today. So this is a good sized Miocene baleen whale. And we know for sure that at some point, at the end or after it had died, it encountered megalodon. And that's because all these markings on the bone were actually made by the megalodon teeth like biting down onto the bone and marking it. So here you can see where the edge of the megalodon tooth struck the bone and then it raked the surface with the serrations leaving marks on the bone, confirming that uh, there was some sort of trophic interaction be between uh, the whale and megalodon. We can't tell from this if this is an example of active predation. Was megalodon hunting the whale and killing it, or had the, was the whale already dead and it was just scavenging its already dead carcass? We can't tell that from this. We know for sure that there was no um, evidence of healing here. The whale did not survive this encounter with megalodon. If it had, there would be callus formation, and, we'll, and I'll show you an example of that in just a few minutes. So I'm now going to show you just a series of uh, photographs of, of fossil whale and dolphin bones that uh, confirm that megalodon was interacting with them. And here's a lovely one from uh, South Carolina. And you can clearly see the serration marks that were left, the raking marks on this rib by the megalodon tooth. Here's another example, uh, 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 another whale rib with a deep megalodon bite into it. The same specimen. So uh, from time to time, we also find megalodon teeth that were bitten by another megalodon tooth. And yeah, there's a, a, the one at the top here is by a, a one that Bill Pertonic, who's with us this evening, found. And you'll notice here that uh, there are serration marks that marked the surface of the enameloid of the megalodon tooth. Here's one where the root of the megalodon tooth was cut into by another megalodon tooth. So typically, we attribute these to self-bitten megalodon teeth. So for example, uh, the megalodon bit the body of a whale. In so doing, it lost a tooth. Then it took another bite. And when that happened, another one of its teeth actually bit into the tooth that had been already shed. But there's no reason to believe that these could not also represent megalodon on megalodon predation, attacking each other, fighting, and marking each other's teeth while they're biting each other's faces. We can't prove that, and we don't know that for sure, but that's certainly a possibility. So what you need to find and bring to me would be a megalodon tooth in which there's embedded another megalodon tooth. The next bone that I'm going to show you is uh, from a dolphin. And it is one of these blackened bones here towards the very end of the tail. It's referred to as a peduncular vertebra. They're the vertebrae just in front of the tail fluke that moves the dolphin through the water. So Stephen Groff, who's back there, found this one along Calvert Cliffs. And you'll notice on both sides of the vertebra, there are these deep gouges. So the only way that you can get deep gouges on the side of a vertebra like this is if it was wedged between two adjacent megalodon teeth. So we think this represents active predation by the megalodon and not just scavenging. And the reason for that is that Modern great white sharks apparently will not scavenge animals that are smaller than themselves. They will scavenge whales, as you can see here. But they won't scavenge animals that are smaller than themselves. They will kill and then eat animals that are smaller than themselves, but they won't scavenge. If the same principle applied to megalodon, then this would represent active predation by megalodon. It wasn't just a giant scavenger. It was, at times, hunting and killing its prey. And I think that that vertebra shows that. So um, what's interesting here is that each one of these gouges represents a separate bite by the megalodon. So it bit the tail repeatedly. It's as though the megalodon was saying to the dolphin, you are never going to get away from me alive. It wanted to disable it so it would probably bleed out, and then it could eat it after it had died. 
This is a sperm whale tooth that was found by Norm Riker in the Lee Creek mine. And it's been whitened with uh, sublime ammonium chloride, which is a white, white, very, or white smoke that puts a very thin layer uh, on a tooth that's very dark so that you can see the detail. It makes the detail pop. So this is the crown of the tooth. That's all that was showing above the gum line. And the rest of this is the root of the tooth. It was embedded in the jaw. And the numbers one, two, and three highlight bite marks that were made by, that left by Megalodon on the tooth. And here's an enlarged view where you can see the raking marks of the serrations on the edge of the tooth. What's interesting is that in order for the Megalodon tooth to mark the sperm whale tooth, it had to cut first through the bone of the lower jaw which to me implies a very powerful bite by the megalodon. So you can see the size of the tooth and uh, the megalodon tooth adjacent to it. From the tooth, we can't tell, again, if it's active predation or if it's scavenging. But we think that a stronger case can be made for active predation. Um, if an animal's biting your, if megalodon's biting your face, he's basically trying to kill you. So there wouldn't be much reason for a megalodon to um, bite the face of an already dead um, sperm whale if it was lying on the bottom of the ocean. There wouldn't be much return for the effort. So to me, this suggests an aggressive type of behavior by megalodon to kill the sperm whale. We also think that uh, we can find examples of failed predation in the fossil record. So failed predation happens today. Great white sharks attack seals or other animals, and they don't kill them. Okay, they scar their bodies badly, and those animals live for the rest of their life with those scars. And so we think there are some fossils that show the same kind of, of interaction between megalodon and its prey. It attacked an animal, but it didn't succeed in killing it. This is a section of, um, a very small section of a big rib of a baleen whale that I found years ago in the Lee Creek Mine. And the numbers one, two, and three point out these swellings on the surface of the rib. Now, ordinarily, you wouldn't expect for there to be any swellings like that on a normal whale rib. So to confirm that it was a rib, we took it to the Garber facility, which is in Silver Hill, Maryland. And if you ever have the chance to go there, take the opportunity, because it's an amazing place where they have two buildings. I'm not going to say that they're the size of a football field each, but they're enormous. And they house the world's largest collection of modern whale and dolphin skeletons. And there's just, well, I'll show you here from the next illustration, next photograph, rather. You can see all these whale skulls standing on end on these large carriages, and then uh, the backbones here of, uh, of whales. So we pulled out ribs, laid them on the floor, and we were able to match up. Now, I'm not suggesting here that that's exactly where that, that piece of bone went. It could have been from any number of ribs. But just to show you that it is a section, a small section, of a very large baleen whale rib. Uh, we CT scanned it. And so you can see here, at the bottom of the photograph, uh, where something struck the bone, struck the rib and disturbed the periosteum, the tissue that surrounds the bone, and caused a callus to form. So the bone was injured. When your bone is injured, uh, usually there's rapid response bone that grows in to sort of um, cover over the damaged bone so that it can be removed and then regenerated. If you continue out the length of the rib, you'll notice that uh, the swellings, the callus formations on the surface of the rib actually form this sort of gentle arc. So this rib was struck by three, three pointed objects. Again, the most likely scenario is that it was bitten by a shark. We don't know for sure that it was megalodon. It would have been a relatively small juvenile megalodon. Um, it could also have been a, a very large great white shark since it was Either my, well, it was probably a Pliocene fossil from, from Lee Creek. So it could have also been a, a great white shark. The next fossil that I'm going to show you came from this location along Calvert Cliffs at uh, Warrior's Rest. It was excavated by Mike Elwood. And it consists of two 
dorsal vertebrae, two backbone pieces, uh, in the lumbar region of the vertebral column. So here's the first, first vertebra. This is the neural spine that you can feel when you run your finger down your back. These are the transverse processes to which muscles attach, and muscles also attach to the side of the vertebra. And so we're looking at the front end of the vertebra. This hole right here is where the spinal cord would go down through the length of the, of the, of the vertebra. I want to point out two things here. So the first is that you'll notice that this whole section of bone is missing. What you should see here is a flat circular surface that was the end of the vertebra that uh, abutted up against the vertebra uh, in front of it. But this bone is missing. You'll also notice that the bottom of the vertebra has been broken away. The break that you can see here, the damage to this vertebra, is not the result of uh, the, the vertebra falling out of the cliffs and being damaged in that way or tumbling around in the surf. This happened while the whale was still alive. But the whale survived because this broken piece of bone is actually fused in place with new bone growth. So the whale was living with this kind of fracture, this spall fracture or compression fracture, for at least several months before it then succumbed to its injuries, perhaps, or was attacked by another megalodon and then died. The reason why this bone right here is missing is because the trauma was so great that it interrupted the blood supply to that part of the vertebra. Bone is living tissue. It needs to be supplied with blood. And if the blood is interrupted, the bone dies. It becomes necrotic. And osteoclasts, which are cells that sort of remodel bone, um, take bone away, removed the damaged or broken bone right in this area. But the whale didn't live long enough for new bone growth to fill that, fill that end of the vertebra. The next uh, illustration is uh, a CT scan, an X-ray uh, through the sagittal section, lengthwise through the vertebra. And you can see here this wide open fracture. So the, the whole um, front end of the vertebra was smashed and broken away. And the force of the impact, the trauma was so great that it actually, so this piece right here, this edge right here should actually be up against this piece right here. And you'll notice how the back end of that piece of bone was jammed into the bottom of the centrum right here. It was telescoped because of the, the impact. Uh, this bone down here, the periosteal reaction, that's the new bone growth that occurred after the injury. So this kind of compression fracture can actually happen in women who are suffering from osteoporosis, but they can also happen in people who are in automobile accidents who only have the lap part of the seat belt on. They don't have the chest strap. And uh, during the collision, they're jerked so uh, violently forward that their backbone is like really, really hyperflexed, really bent. And it puts so much pressure on the bottom of the vertebra that it can just like crush it. So here's an example, uh, an illustration showing three whale vertebrae in their normal, natural uh, um, orientation. And uh, this one down here shows that the, 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 the vertebrae are sort of bent. The whale is bent, hyperflexed, and the bottoms of the vertebrae touch each other with such force, in the, in the case that I just showed you, that the, the bottom of the vertebra broke away and was tele telescoped, jammed into the back part of that vertebra. This is a transverse section through uh, the second vertebra that was found along Calvert Cliffs uh, of the same whale. And when I first saw these, I, I mean, my reaction was, well, that's interesting, but I didn't understand what I was looking at. It didn't mean anything to me. So what you're looking at here is uh, the vertebra. This is the transverse process. These are the transverse processes where muscles would attach. Muscles would attach to the side of the vertebra. Here's the neural canal where the spinal cord went through it. What's missing is the top of the neural spine. The, the white, bright white here, is the original outer surface of the vertebra. So this 
periosteal reactive bone, this thickness right here, occurred after the injury. It's a result of the trauma. And I didn't understand, I didn't know what I was looking at, and so I sent this to uh, an ortho orthopedic surgeon, and he was like, wow, this is amazing. What this shows is that the force of the impact was so great that the soft tissue that was attached to the vertebra was torn off, was pulled off. Uh, as a result, the tissue that was here was actually pulled out to this point right here, and uh, there was bleeding into that space. There was a hemorrhage, a hematoma that formed, like a big blood clot. And then the new bone grew into this area, filled up this space. So this was a very violent um, incident <laughs> that this whale like suffered. What's also interesting is that this megalodon tooth was immediately associated with those two vertebrae. So we don't know if this megalodon tooth came to be there just out of serendipity. It was shed by a megalodon, it sank to the bottom, it just happened to be buried with those two vertebrae. Or it came about as a result of the final encounter between a megalodon and that injured whale, so it was the megalodon that killed the whale. Or could it have been from the megalodon that slammed into that whale with such force that it did something like this. It hyperflexed the backbone to such an extent that it just like broke away the vertebra and jammed it into the, into the back part uh, of uh, the centrum. I think this is what happened. I don't know that for sure, but it makes a really great story. It's not an un unreasonable uh, story either. So I'm just gonna say a few words about competition. I don't know if Victor's gonna deal with this uh, when he talks about like extinction uh, in a couple of weeks, but um, during the late Miocene, there was one macro, other major macro predator that existed. It was uh, a sperm whale that uh, remains have been found in South America, in, in the Atacama Desert of Peru. And it's known as Leviathan. So here's a restoration of what this giant macro predatory sperm whale would have looked like or could have looked like. This was done by that same French film company out of Paris that I worked with in 2017. And here's just a comparison of sizes of these, uh, of these large marine predators. So while in Peru, I was able to look at the teeth of uh, this Leviathan. Here's a single tooth compared to a large megalodon tooth. What's interesting about these sperm whales is that they only had one set of teeth throughout their life. They didn't replace their teeth. They didn't even have milk teeth. The teeth they were born with, that's all the teeth that they had. So just outside uh, the, the, the museum in downtown Lima, there is this lovely restoration of a modern sperm whale skeleton. And you'll notice that they have teeth in the lower jaw. They don't show the teeth in the upper part of the rostrum here. They do have little vestigial teeth, little tiny teeth that aren't even anchored in a socket. They're just held in by soft tissue. So these are deep diving sperm whales. These, this is the modern sperm whale. And they're going at depth to catch a giant squid. So they're not feeding on marine mammals. In the museum, they have this lovely restoration of uh, the skull of Leviathan showing the enormous teeth both in the upper and lower jaws. And the wear facets that occur on some of these uh, teeth, the occlude, where the teeth occlude, they would wear each other down. Just in case you haven't seen the exhibit, it's up on the mezzanine um, level gallery. It's open until the end of 2022, and it highlights modern shark jaws, and of course, restorations of some of the uh, extinct sharks that have been found along Calvert Cliffs. And our next lecture will be given by uh, Victor Perez. So come out for that. And thank you very much for coming out this evening. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer those now. Thank you. I don't know that. It wouldn't surprise me if they knew that. 
because presumably they could also have been catching sharks that inhabit the bay, and they were probably using every part of the animal. So it wouldn't surprise me at all that they had made the connection. But I don't know that, and I don't know how we would know that for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised. In fact, <laughs> you know, I would be surprised if they didn't know that, actually. Yes. Thank you. So out in the um, entry gallery to paleontology, on the end wall, we actually have a cast replica of a large sperm whale tooth that was found locally. And in our collection, we actually have one, maybe two examples of, two, of large sperm whale teeth that were here. We just don't have the skulls of those animals. All we have are these large teeth, and the largest is about that long. Now, it's not the same size as the Leviathan, so it was probably a different kind of sperm whale, but it would have been a macro predator. It almost certainly had teeth that size, both in the upper and lower jaws, and uh, indicative of an animal that was probably feeding on what Megalodon was feeding on, on um, shallow water, relatively shallow water uh, marine mammals. So Leviathan itself is described from the Tortonian um, period, um, and so it's, uh, it's late Miocene, it's upper Miocene. Mm -hmm. So in odontocetes, it characterizes that whole group of, of uh, toothed whales, that they only have one set of teeth. Uh, there's no um, evidence of them having more than one set of teeth uh, during their life. So we, we know that from looking at, at modern uh, odontocetes, and uh, the same, I believe, applies to uh, fossil odontocetes. So when they're born, for example, a dolphin, the rostrum is shorter than, than it is in an adult, right? During, during its ontogeny, during its life, the length of the snout elongates relative to what it was like as a juvenile. So they look like babies when they're born and their snout gets longer. So when they're born, they have all the teeth that they're going to have, and all the teeth are like pressed right up against each other. They're jammed into the jaw, there's no space between them. And as they mature, and the, and the snout becomes longer, then there's space that's added between those teeth, and they actually develop a bony septum between each tooth to hold it in place. So when they're born, the teeth, there's no bone between the teeth, they're just like pressed together. Uh, no, the cementum is added on afterwards. Yeah, so they're, they're, they're uh, putting layer upon layer of cementum around the tooth as, as they mature. Yes, good point. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, wait, there's one more question. Oh, very quick question. Um, the example that you had here, the end, uh, the basal verbal and then the fracture or fracture of the snap like this, is associated with this. Did, did the size of that tooth Size Megalodon that you see in that also you know, you allude to you know active predation, possibly inactive, or could that have been a scab that was smaller and was not able to create that scab tissue? Very good observation. Uh, no, that megalodon tooth would not have come from the size of the individual that was shown in the artwork. That was a much larger meg tooth. That one that the, the tooth that was found was an anterior tooth. And so it's a relatively it, the tooth is only about two and a half inches long, and so it could not have come from 
you know, the, the giant that was like pulling it out of the water and bending its backbone that way. Yeah. Thank you very much again. Thank you.